Now, check this out. Here's the second generation disintegration of Comet schwassmann wachmann Fragment B. So this is just, we go back, I'm not sure, let's see uh, which one of these fragments is fragment B. But what you see here graphically depicted is this hierarchical disintegration of these cometary nuclei. So one of these fragments here, whichever one is fragment B, here is a, um, a photograph of it in the, uh, what they're calling the second generation disintegration of comet schwassmann wachmann So here, when you look into this cluster, there could be thousands or even hundreds of thousands of, of pieces in there, ranging in all different sizes from dust size up through boulder size up to Tunguska size, which is maybe 150 feet roughly in diameter, the size of, a, of say, a 10-story building, or even bigger. You might have sub-kilometer sized objects in here. Like here would be the main, the main nuclei, nucleus remnant up here. Um, and I'm not sure of the diameter of that, but the point is, is, you know, this is, this, this opens the, the doorway to a whole nother um, category of phenomena that can happen. See, in these oversimplified models of impact scenarios, it's like, well, one rock from space hits the earth one time and then does what it does. And then maybe not for a hundred thousand or 200,000 or a million years, then it happens again. Right. This, the, the scenario is getting a lot more complex than that, you see. And so a lot of the attacks on some of the impact theories are really going back to kind of some of the, the older models, oversimplified models of impact phenomena, which is in a way kind of a straw man. Comet Linear. So here's another comet um, taken with the uh, uh, taken on August fifth of two thousand, and what you see here is is um, several stages. Here's um, one image, and then a closer up image here, where you can, if you really look into the the details of this, you see there are many, many, many fragments in there, uh, countless fragments. So the Earth encountering something like this. Is going to be a completely different scenario than the Earth counting a, encountering a single, say, rock-like asteroid. Although some of these, some of these particles in here, if you will, might actually be, uh, you know, what we're learning about the comets is that they're really um, almost hybrid-like creatures. And as like we get more into the younger Dryas, we're going to see that. Um, in some respects, some of the critics referring to the uh, impact hypothesis being a Frankenstein monster isn't really that far, far off the track because what we see is, is, is a lot of different types of material that apparently were delivered to the earth with, with different effects. And it also may not be as simple as one single impact. We might be looking at several encounter type events over a period of several thousand years. And that certainly complicates the picture. There is the so-called string of pearls, the Shoemaker-Levy 9 cometary debris chain. Now this started out as a single cometary nucleus, but what happened is it came too close to Jupiter. Do you understand the concept of the Roche limit? Okay, the Roche limit is simply a zone within which a uh, a cometary nucleus or, or, or any bound together object, an aggregated object, where its internal cohesion is overcome by the, um, by the external gravitational field. So there's a Roche limit around Jupiter. Like right? tidal forces almost on the, Where the on tidal the forces will disaggregate that coherent object, right? Now, where exactly is the Roche limit? Well, that's going to vary depending on the, 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 the nature of the object in question. If it's a lower density object that's loosely aggregated, then clearly, you know, the Roche limit's going to be farther out for that object. If it's a tightly bound single object, like a, a metallic asteroid, well, then it's clearly not going to be uh, torn apart as, as readily. But the idea is that if an object passes within that Roche limit, the tidal forces are going to rip it apart. And that's exactly what happened with Shoemaker-Levy 9. How many times did that nucleus make a, a, a Jovian uh, pass? 
I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't looked. Maybe somebody has got some estimates on it. I haven't looked into it. Probably multiple times. And as it was doing this, it probably got closer to Jupiter on each successive pass. See, this is what it was doing. It was, it was sort of the, like I've said before, the ping pong ball game between the sun and between Jupiter. So on the final passage, the, I guess what you'd say, the penultimate passage, that object came within the Roche limit of Jupiter and the tidal forces of Jupiter ripped it apart. And that one object evolved into 21 separate objects. And that's what you're seeing right here in this string of pearls. And here's an, uh, an artist's depiction of the string of pearls approaching Jupiter. And what you saw there was in the, the week of July, um, sec, I believe second week in July of 2004. One, two, three, four, five successive 21 impacts and they all fell into Jupiter and left these enormous um, plumes within the Jovian atmosphere. Which, which was my background for the, for the last episode. You had two or ah. three of them that were visible there in the, in the background behind me, but uh, the, pr the previous image was probably better, but this one shows it too, just to be able to differentiate the, the trajectory. You know, all the, all the objects, the bright spots are following the orbit of the object but the solar wind is pushing the tail yeah. away from the sun. So, so those last two images are, you're able to see the, the, the two motions or the two, the two different uh, angles that the, that the thing's moving at. Right. I read recently as well that they're still following those plumes. Yeah, the sure. plume of Jupiter. Yeah, and that was in 97, to see, right? To get an update. 25 years later, yeah. Uh, it, if my memory is correct, wasn't there uh, a good bit of, of surprise about about this basically bombardment of comet fragments that this is something that nobody really had considered before to see evidence like this? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. And, yeah. And it was it was a surprise to the astronomical community when frankly it shouldn't be. Well, that it wouldn't it wouldn't be common enough that we could actually see it, Witness it in, yeah. you know soon after having the ability to look you know <laughs> it would be so uncommon that it would be you know so long that we wouldn't actually see one and then there it is well and here is an example of a catena a crater chain where you would have presumably the same type of a phenomena where you have an object that's disintegrated in this case it looks like the cluster would be very tightly bound in other words the, the pieces are almost on top of each other when the train comes in and starts hitting one after another um here's another example so these things are starting to turn up you see that look like they're not single uh, a single impact event but a, a, a multiple impact event in well multiple impacts in one event that would probably be separated in this case by mere, you know, seconds or minutes. So we need we need to get beyond the idea of there just being one single solid object. Yes. These things these things are breaking up as they move around. They they come close to objects and and reach this Roche limit and get pulled apart. And then the you know there's there's a debris field, and that that's much more common probably and more telling of what we may have experienced in the younger drives.